Hey everyone, Ripley with Bob's Watches. I'm here with Justin in the studio, and today we're talking all about the Omega Seamaster Aquaterra and going over five things you should know if you're planning on buying one. So the Aquaterra is kind of one of those models that I feel like it doesn't get the attention it deserves, but on paper, it really, it could very well be the only watch you'd ever need and has one of the least objectionable sort of design languages. I agree, I, I really like the Aquaterra and like you, I kind of feel like it's often overlooked, right? It just, it doesn't get a lot of spotlight and I think it's kind of a shame because honestly, I think it's a great watch. Well, I think, I, I think the, probably the first point here is that it's a, it's a relatively new, collection. I mean, it first came out in 2002, but it's part of, it's not it's so much a collection. Omega only has those four collections, Speedmaster, Seamaster, Constellation, DeVille. The Aquaterra is a Seamaster. It's part right. of the Seamasters, but what's also a Seamaster are these legendary watches like the Bond <clears throat> Seamaster Diver 300, um, the Ploprof at All Planet Oceans. Right. It's a really saturated, um, it's a really saturated collection. And when you think Seamaster, you think dive watch and, you know, the Aquaterra doesn't really meet that brief. Sure, and that's a point to mention. When you think Seamaster, that's a huge range of watches and styles and complications, and you know, it's just a very, very broad range. Um, so it makes sense that they would kind of put it in a, like a subclass, um, because like you said, it's technically it's not a dive watch, right? It's very at home, you know, in the sport category. It's kind of that, that mix between sport and dress. Um, so yeah, while it's very far from something like a Ploprof or a Planet Ocean, um, you know, it's still kind of in that category. So to me, it, it makes perfect sense as that kind of uh, the mix between dress and, you know, a little nicer sporty watch. Yeah, so I think probably the second point is like what like even what is the Omega Seamaster uh, Aquaterra? You know, it's um it's a tribute to Omega's marine heritage, and right. you know it's they were uh, some had some of the very first water resistant watches in the 30s, um, but and obviously this isn't that. Omega's first purpose built dive watch came out in 57 as part of the trilogy, the Seamaster 300. Um, but what these are, are inspired by the water resistant Seamaster dress watches from the 50s and 60s that predate Omega dive watches, um, but were known for their water resistance and have the signature Hippocampus logo, which I'm sure one of these actually here. So, you know, this has been Omega's logo for water resistant cases. Um, it's obviously, you know, a water resistant watch. Um, and like you said, it's, if you look at this watch, or I mean, especially if you look at one of the uh, more elegant executions of it, like right here, you'd be forgiven for thinking that this is a dress watch. Sure. Um, but it, it isn't, you know, like you said, it's kind of a mix between a dress watch and a sports watch. <clears throat> right. Um, and, you know, it's inspired by watches that sort of predate the concept of tool watches. Mm -hmm. You know, in the 50s, you probably had a watch. Right. It was supposed to be as durable and accurate, and you'd wear it with a suit. You'd also probably wear it or take it off if you were in working sure. in the yard or something. But it sort of kind of harkens back to that era of the, you know, the dressy, go anywhere, do mm -hmm. anything type of timepiece. And like you mentioned, it's very at home in the water, right? We have 500 feet water resistance. So, I mean, technically, you can swim with this, you can dive with this in, you know, yeah, most point, point, num point number three, it's not a dive watch, but you probably could actually dive with exactly, it. Exactly, yeah. It doesn't have, you know, all the luminous markers and the unidirectional no bezel, bezel. And, you know, it, it doesn't have all those dive features and complications, but, you know, it has the water resistance and, you know, it, it will work for diving. Yeah, and most models have screw down crowns. Uh, the couple exceptions like this model that's no longer in production here this enormous 45 and 49 almost 50 millimeter model it's uh, got a hand wind movement um, so there's it's a standard push pull crown so you can wind it but if you notice right here on the side of the case still 150 meters 500 foot depth rating um, the minimum requirements for like a dive computer are 100 meters most dive watches hit 200 Samariners are 300 like the Seamaster divers but um, 100 meters is more than fine. Yes. That is you know, 330 feet, no one's diving that deep with the exception of very specific purpose right. built applications. <clears throat> and so it's not a dive watch, but if you were on vacation wearing your Aquaterra and found yourself going on an impromptu dive and didn't want to leave it on sure. the boat, it would be fine. Yeah, exactly. You don't have fine. to worry about it. It's perfectly capable and and I think that's part of uh, you know, part of the point of the collection. You're not buying this watch as a dive watch, but if the situation arises, you know, it's nice to know that it's 100% capable. Yeah, and I think the name, I mean, the name Aqua Terra, sure. you know, uh, land or water, land, mm -hmm. and it, it is the watch that it, it's as at home on land as it is in the water, right. although it wasn't really designed for 
any one specific sport or activity. With that in mind, the um, of the dials of most feature this striped, they call it a teak pattern. Right. And it's supposed to um, sort of emulate the wooden deck surfaces on like luxury yachts. Sure. Um, you see it with other brands do it. The Nautilus sort of has a similar vibe, although their lines go the opposite direction. Um, and again, just kind of like a boat, you're not, you're in the water, but not actually wet and in, in right. the water. Right, right, <laughs> in the yes. water. So I think it kind of works on that level too. But when you look at the core features of these, luminous markers, broad kind of sporty luminous hands, it's not a dress watch. Right. It's, and you can get them on a bracelet, of course you can get them on a leather strap or even a rubber strap, but it's not a sports watch, it's not a dress watch, but it's more than comfortable sure. existing in both worlds. And that's kind of, uh, another point is the diversity of the collection. Yeah, I mean, point four, probably one of Omega's most diverse sub-collections. Just talking about, you know, it's not quite a dress watch, it's a, you know, it's kind of a dress watch and it's kind of a sport watch. If you compare a couple like these, you know, you see, here, this gold Aquaterra looks very dressy. It's on leather, it, it just looks really nice. And then we have this more sporty. They have other complications like the GMT and the stainless case. And oh, I you know, mean, we continue have, on, yeah. on that. Yeah, here we go. Uh, add in another type of complication. You've got a chronograph. The chronograph, right. So, you know, there's a wide range of, you know, they can go from, they're all kind of in the middle, but they can go from, you know, much heavier, much closer to the dress watch side or much closer to the sport watch side. And I think it's kind of nice because, you know, you might have uh, uh, different tastes and different requirements. You might want the more dressy one, and I'm looking for a more sporty one, and there's definitely something that either of us can find in there. Yeah, so I mean, if you're the type that wants a dress watch because you're wearing business casual attire and you know you need the complications at the same time, you're mm -hmm. gonna have to compromise. Maybe a Speedmaster, you can wear it with a suit, but it's far more sporty than right. something like this, and it's double goes for that as a GMT compared to like a, Planet Ocean GMT. Yeah. Um, and then also within that diversity, obviously the materials certainly and complications mm -hmm. can inform how formal or dressy or sporty is. But like look here between two very similar models, both on a bracelet, just with different color dials and accents, and you know, very different vibes. Right. You know, on this one here, it's if it's yes, it's on a bracelet, so it's a bit Sporty, mm -hmm. you know, but at the same time, if you put that on like a leather strap, that could easily work with a suit. Exactly, yeah. It's clean, it's understated, um, you know, the white dial's really nice. It has the, the texture, you know, we talk about like the lines on the dial, um, but they're not in your face and they're not loud, you know, it's, it's really clean. And then you contrast it with this one here, and it's basically the same watch, you know, mm -hmm. but with the black, the pops of green, mm -hmm. it's quite a bit sportier. It, it looks a lot yeah. sportier with just a couple little detail changes, right? Yeah, and then again, you know, this is just complications in materials. You've got steel, you can so, get titanium. There's, and then, and let's look at the size. The sizes, We'd yeah. Be remiss if we didn't compare. So I think within the current collection, you can get them as small as 28 millimeters and as large as uh, 43. However, um, that's just the ones that you'll find on Omega's site. Ones like this, this is nearly 50 millimeters. And I mean, look at that. It's. So, yeah, there is a giant difference in size on all these, like you said. Yeah. I mean, all the way up from like a small lady size to uh, kind of a, a little bit smaller sporty size to the standard sporty size. Then there's ones that are a little bit larger and then we have just full on giant with almost 50 millimeter case. And you can get some really, really lavish ones. Solid gold, full diamond dials, mm -hmm. uh, ruby hour mark. You, it can get really, really right. opulent should you want to go that avenue, but it can also go really, really minimal. Like this one here, uh, it's an annual calendar. You know, that's the Sky Dweller's an annual calendar, right. um, and Omega's doing some really cool stuff with modern annual calendars, but this doesn't scream like an overtly complicated watch. Right. It looks just like a, a day date type of thing yeah. like you'd find on so many, and there's no additional pushers on the side of the case or, or anything like that. So it's, you know, it's basically your calendar wristwatch, yeah. but. It's kind of having a. a it, it's it's a, nice. I like that. Yeah, it's got a bit yeah. more under the hood than mm -hmm. it lets on. And also, let's uh, talk about movements, right? I mean, there are most of them are automatic movements. Mm -hmm. However, they are offered in quartz. We have a, a quartz, quartz version right, right here. here. Yeah. Um, but you know, it's not just the ladies that are often uh, offered in quartz. We have um, you know, kind of like the uh, the standard Aquaterra that you see the forty millimeter case or whatever the. And um, I think that speaks to the watch collection as a whole, like. 
it's not a dive watch, it's not a racing crown, it wasn't made for one specific mm -hmm. sport environment type of person. It is the watch that can be worn by everyone, right? Um, regardless of what they're doing. And I think that speaks for not just the colors and the preferences and the complications and the materials, but also just the movement as well. Right. I like a mechanical movement. I know you do as well. Mm -hmm. I can also appreciate a quartz movement, but there's some people that have a really strong opinion one way or the sure. other. And there's some people that simply don't want a mechanical movement right. because they want their watch to be nice, always accurate, and whether yeah. they have it off their wrist for two hours or two weeks, yeah. you know, they want it to just be the right time. And the fact that Omega hasn't turned its complete you know, it's back completely on right. the uh, quartz movement lets them know that they're looking for some broad market appeal with the Aquaterra and, you know, I'm happy that they're keeping those options alive for everybody. Absolutely, especially since there's so many other options in the watches and, you know, size, materials, uh, dial colors, complications, we've talked about all these things. Probably the most, um, you know, the biggest decision that comes up is like a deal killer, so to speak, for watches, the movement. Either, mm -hmm. like you said, some people are very, uh, you know, it's very divisive. Some people are either 100% they want quartz or 100% uh, they want automatic, and they offer both, which is, is yeah, great. Yeah, and if you really want to look for some discontinued models, you can go get a nice hand wine one as well. And then the movements are also a point worth mentioning. Like, uh, yes, the ones with complications, yes, there's a lot of diversity, and yes, the ones with complications are something special in their own right, but the standard time and date Aqua Terra movement that you're gonna find in the bulk of the models comes with some cool party tricks of its own. It's not a travel watch, but as you can see here, this is one of the, in one of the more modern models. When you unscrew the crown, because again, 150 meters, it's water resistant, and pull it out to the first notch, instead of quick setting the date, it jumps the hour hand forward or backwards like a GMT. So it's kind of got, again, a little more under the hood than you would otherwise mm -hmm. see or anticipate from like a dressy, sporty watch. Mm -hmm. um, and again, really practical, doesn't brag about it, and like so many of Omega's modern movements, uh, entirely anti-magnetic, mm -hmm. master coaxial, yeah. uh, master chronometer rated, mm -hmm. Um, so what you're getting from some of these is fantastic magnetic resistance, um, practical features, super versatile styling, and what is objectively an overbuilt everyday watch. Right. You know, it's more than strong enough to, and I think, we, you know, let's talk about other models on the market that this is sort of. I was gonna say, uh, let's talk about price on this and you price, know, all these and features. And also, I, probably its biggest competitor I'd say is the Datejust. Right. You know what I mean? Uh, Rolex is oyster cases, 100 meter water resistant. Mm -hmm. It's sort of, it's dressy, but you you can right. wear it out and about. Um, on paper, the Aquaterra just brings more to the table at mm -hmm. a significantly lower price point. And I think it's a great alternative to that person who likes the ethos of the Datejust or the, you know, in a classic oyster perpetual, but doesn't necessarily want a Rolex or wants, right. wants more freedom in terms of what their watch looks like, you know? Exactly, yeah, and, and I think it's a tremendous value. Um, like you said, there's all these uh, all these features and uh, things it brings to the table at uh, significantly less price than a lot of its competitors. Um, and I think, you know, that's one of, one of the shames why it's so overlooked because I think it really is, a, you know, a, it offers a ton of value for what it is. Well, let's just talk about this one. I think uh, probably the retail price on this watch is probably closer to seven or eight grand, mm -hmm. but um, well, on the pre-owned market, you can find these for under 5K. Right. For a, you know, like a, a steel sports bot watch with an annual calendar right. from a premier brand like Omega, that seems to be a tremendous value. Yeah. Um, that's less than the price of just kind of any kind of Speedmaster moon watch. It's right in sort of that same pocket that you're gonna find a Seamaster diver. And if you don't want a overtly sporty watch, this is a great alternative. Significantly less than even just a Rolex Oyster Perpetual, right? And yeah. I mean, we're talking, you know, an annual calendar complication here and, you know, all the other things you mentioned. So, yeah, I, I love that about him. Um, you know, I love a good value in my watch and, you know, I, uh, I definitely give it some extra points for that. Yeah, and I think it's also one of the things that's cool about it is, um, uh, well, I guess point five here, um, you, you'll spot an Aquaterra in a few James Bond films. That, yeah. So uh, Daniel That's Craig, cool. it, it didn't wasn't worn by Bond prior to the Daniel Craig years, but he wears a blue dial model, uh, two actually different ones, mm -hmm. Inspector and Skyfall. And I haven't seen No Time to Die, but I believe he might briefly wear one in there, but I know the other, the female MI6 agent, uh, Naomi's also she wears wearing, one in there, yeah. wearing one as well, the 38 mil. And in my opinion, that's pro the Aquaterra is more of it's more right for Bond than than the the, the, the Bond Seamaster. Sure, it is, and you know, kind of how we we started this conversation, where you know, 
it walks that line between dress and sport or dress and utility, right? Where that's 100% James Bond, right? Like he has to have the utility and it has to live up to, you know, punishing conditions and, you know, diving and all this other stuff. Yet he also has to have it on with his tuxedo underneath his dive suit instantly. So, you know, it's really versatile and and I agree. I think it's a, a great choice for a Bond watch. It, it, exactly. And it's nice to kind of see them you know, obviously Omega has the relationship with the Bond franchise. Obviously, there is a whole No Time to Die Seamaster Diver, mm -hmm. and you, the, the Diver 300 is going to be, you know, the Bond watch from Omega probably for, you know, as sure. long as that relationship exists. But it's nice to see them acknowledging the other collections. They did a bunch with him in the Planet Oceans, and it's really great to see an Aquaterra because if you saw an Aquaterra with paired with his nice Tom Ford suit at mm -hmm. an event, you wouldn't think twice about the watch. It belongs at that gala yeah, or whatever he's attending. But at the same time, should he find himself tossed into the ocean or you know deep yeah. in the muck or whatever, oh, it's fine. Screw down case patch, yeah. screw down crown, 150 yeah. meters, steel build, easy. So I think that's a nice little tidbit. You'll, yeah. it, it's technically you know in the Bond watch canon as well. It so. Is. For those that it matters to in the cultural if reference. it's cool enough for bond it's cool enough for me yeah and the blue <laughs> dial is fantastic the blue dial is fantastic so on that note can we talk about this a little bit so they do this on a lot of them right they have the blue markers and blued hands yeah. and the great dial and this is a look that i see um kind of mostly on omega and on this watch it's i don't want to say like their signature but you know you see it a lot and it's instantly recognizable mm -hmm. on on that look and i think it's great um i love the gray dial and the blued hands and markers um it kind of gives it that little sportier vibe and kind of how we talked about before i probably lean a little more towards the sporty end of the spectrum of the Same. you know the duality so um i think it's really cool and it's a nice little touch of of uh, flavor and, and color on a, like a dressier sport watch. Yeah, and I mean, the design language between all of these watches here is apparent. They've got the twisted lugs, no crown right. guards. Even when they've got pushers or something kind of strange going on like this one, you can very much see that one's related to the other. Mm -hmm. um, similar style of hour markers. But in that same breath, the designs have evolved and changed. So if you're the type of person that just hates six o'clock dates like they're doing now, well, the older models have them at three. Mm -hmm. You know, you can also, on the ladies' side, there's some of the gem set watches have no dates. Mm -hmm. You know, um, if you want a <clears throat> GMT with a chronograph, there is one of those as well. There's yeah. a GMT chrono with a date all in the Aquaterra family. So there is something for everyone, and it's kind of a fun collection to explore. I didn't realize how many different models until you start digging through. And all Aquaterras have been around for less than 20 years. And in less than 20 years, what they've done, not in terms of just the advancements made to the collection, but in just the number of different iterations, which are all good and kind right. of just add to the flavor bag of it. Um, I think it just deserves more attention. I do too. They've done a good job of evolving the line to stay current and bring new features and new styles without straying too far from, you know, the original look and the original design language. And, you know, like you said, the, you see them, it's like you know it's an Aquaterra, even though the combinations of size, material, complications, um, colors is almost infinite once you start like connecting all those together. So I, I think they've done a great job with the line in that aspect. And I could seriously own several of these. Same, there, there's same. plenty and there's enough, that I could fill up a box Yeah, and there's enough diversity that it wouldn't necessarily feel like you had all of the same watch. I mean, this, what we have in front of us is only a small sampling sure. of what's out there, but what what's your like ideal Aquaterra? Like case size, is one of them here? Would you do, do a, one of the complicated models? Uh, 41 and a half, 38. You know, I like the simple. So a lot of times, you know, we'll we'll choose our, our pick at the end of the video. Um, I'm going to do something a little different. I'm not going to choose one. I'm going to put a couple out there just because it's so, uh, you know, there's so so many to choose from. I'm going to put these guys up just oh, for, of, yeah, and, and there's of plenty like other ones I could put. They're very similar, but, um, and we have the green version of uh, you know this model on the left, but it comes in other colors. I think the yellow is fantastic. Oh, the but black and a yellow striped yes. one. Yeah, the, that was one of the first anti-magnetic models where they were trickling out their all that fifteen thousand plus Gauss. Uh, the bumblebee. Uh -huh. I love that one. Love I, that I one think too. it's great. So yeah, I have a really really hard time choosing. Um, again, it would be kind of on my mood that day or what I'm doing. You know, I love the white dial. I'm a sucker for a white dial, and I love their uh, you know that deck pattern on it. I think it's so good and just it's really clean and just enough. 
enough. Um, so yeah, that kind of captures my heart with the uh, you know the cleanliness and the and the classiness of the white tail. But I also love the sporty look on the green or like I mentioned the yellow. Um, honestly, all the colors look awesome. So yeah, I, I can't just nail down one. Um, I'll, I'll nail it down to as you know this watch, but in several variations. Gotcha. Uh, and I mean, very similar here. Um, I'm probably I'd probably go a different way. I between these, I would probably choose the black. I love a little pop of green. Mm -hmm. But among just the ones in front of us, I'd be kind of torn between, you know, full dress. Yeah, I'd just wear it as a dress watch. Mm -hmm. um, this one, which I think I just I just love the way it looks. Yeah. Um, and I, I do love a good six o'clock date. I thought six is my preference versus three. And just right there, the annual calendar. Um, uh, just for the for the value that it offers for the complication, uh, and it's a fantastic case profile. I mean, like I have my biggest qualm with so many watches it's just too big for my little wrist and you know right here I'm what about six and a half six and three quarter six and three quarters mm -hmm. I think you know that does this doesn't wear that big at all you know that's if you want it to it's be nice. on the dressier side that's uh Mm -hmm. It's pretty solid. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, these are great choices. I love um, the same thing. I would just take that gold one and wear it as a dress watch. Um, it's funny, all three of these watches almost made my pick out there as well, right? It's so hard to choose. I mean, there's just so many great watches here. So yeah, I, I, I love it. I, I love that there's uh, you know there's that diversity and um, you know you have those options. And I, the blue looks so good. Like the way they do that blue, it's like that dark blue, but you know, it's not, it doesn't look like black in the sun. It really has that depth to it. And it's just great, it's great. Yeah, I, um, it, people always talk about go anywhere, do anything watches, right. where it's dressy enough to wear with a suit. And people often champion a true diehard sports watch, but mm -hmm. more refined like dive watch or something. But if you want that go anywhere, do anything watch, your dressy tool watch, uh, honestly, Aquaterra would be the first words out of my mouth. Absolutely, and I've said it before, I'm absolutely, not a one watch guy. No, I, I can't. I'm, I can't be that guy. No, I have polyamorous but, watch. Yes, hundred yes. percent. But you know, if my arm got twisted and I had to make a choice, and it was one watch, even we'll just say like maybe a, a one watch for a year guy kind of thing. Um, Aquaterra might very well get the nod. Like that's uh, that's one I could pick where I think that you know I could get something that's casual enough and dressy enough and sporty enough, and, and I think the Aquaterra could tick all those boxes. It does, and you do see it on the wrists of those one watch dudes. They're not watch enthusiasts. They wanted a good watch. They knew Omega was a right. reputable brand. They went in, they didn't want something that looked purpose built because it was a purpose they didn't need. Right. Um, and they wear an Aquaterra, and they might have been wearing it for the last 10 years or more. Every day, that's their watch. Yeah. And I'll run into, my uncle is almost one of these guys. He also has a Sea Dweller, but it's an Aquaterra that's his, like, you know, go-to sure. nicer watch when he's not wearing something digital-based. Yeah. And so you do see them out in the wild. It serves its purpose. And yeah. for the enthusiast that wants, even if they're going to own that go one watch, go anywhere, do anything, it's the you know it's an easy one to add to your watch box that won't break the bank. Exactly. And if you can't find an Aquaterra that. you don't like, you're really not looking hard <laughs> yeah. enough. Yeah. Or you hate like the pointed hour markers or something. Right. But like, even still, there's <clears throat> there's some other options outside of that. So well, there you have it. I mean, this is only a tiny sampling of all of the Aquaterra range, and you know every year there's more between all the limited editions. I keep finding more that I didn't realize existed, mm -hmm. and even now, I, like uh, looking for this. Video, there was things that I came across that I didn't realize were even an Aquaterra. So, oh, that's nice, that's nice. There's all these new things. I would actually encourage you guys, if you aren't that familiar with Aquaterra, do some research, dig around. I bet you'll find something that you'll be surprised about and you'll probably like. Yeah, absolutely. So you, you know some of our favorite Aquaterras, but we want to hear yours. So if you own an Aquaterra, are thinking about buying one, let us know the one your pick or kind of what you'd want in your go anywhere, do anything watch uh, and let us know in the comments below. And as always, don't forget to like and subscribe to our YouTube channels so that you can stay up to date in our latest video content.